According to Sigmund Freud, the human psyche is divided in three parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. The superego is formed as a result of our brains processing and internalizing society's ideas of morals and rules. It's the perfectionist voice in our heads responsible for the creation of the idealized, flawless version of ourselves. It controls our sense of right and wrong and keeps our instinctual needs in check by inflicting us with feelings of guilt, anxiety, and inferiority if we break any of life's moral guidelines. The ego is a mediator for the id and the superego. Like the id, it aims for pleasure but it abides with the reality principle, meaning it tries to achieve gratification in realistic ways. So while the id would just tell us to start grabbing all of the food in our sight because we're hungry, the ego understands the existence of the outside world and social norms, so it stops us from acting on the id's whims. On the other hand, while the superego would tell us that killing is wrong no matter the circumstances, the ego, if faced with a particular situation of I'm being hunted down by a psychopathic serial killer who wants to and is going to kill me unless I defend myself, would ignore the superego's moral absolutes and tell us to stab Michael Myers with a wire hanger to save our lives. But what I really want to talk about is the id, the obscure, inaccessible part of our personality. Driven only by the impulsion to obtain satisfaction for the instinctual needs in accordance with the pleasure principle. That being the psychic force that makes us seek for immediate gratification and pleasure and to avoid pain and unpleasure. The id is purely instinctual. It wants what it wants and therefore is where we find our darkest secrets and desires. Be it then of an aggressive nature, like how sometimes you just want to slap a bitch, or of a sexual nature, like to make something totally off the top of my head that bears absolutely no similarities to any of my own personal desires, you may want to be the center of attention like Chris Evans, Luterling, Jason Momoa, Trevante Rhodes, style heckling gangbang that leaves you covered in so much <laughs> It looks just about ready to be shipped to the main exhibition at Madame Tussauds Wax Museum. I really love to have fun. Or even secrets of a much, much darker nature. Secrets you've tried to repress and deny to yourself, but that keep burning inside of you, corroding your soul, making you question your sanity, nay, your very humanity, given its insidious, unthinkable, unspeakable darkness. <sighs> Hi, my name is Vinicius, and I am a Swifty. Alright, in fairness sake, I'm a Swifty in the loosest connotation of being a fan of a significant amount of Taylor Swift's work. And that's not me pretending like I'm cool or have good taste or anything. I just feel like invoking the official name of a fandom implies a level of devotion and worship to the thing that I don't really have for anything other than Chris Evans' stressed up hooker photo shoot. Like a lot of people, I too was drawn in by the mammoth power and appeal of Swift's 1989 album, which was frankly the first time I really paid any real attention to her. I went on to notice that she got elevated from famous to god status by gays and teenage girls alike, but I never counted myself amongst her artist's devotees and, perhaps more relevantly, I really, really do not care about her personal life. My reputation's never been worse, so. Every single tabloid-worthy drama she's ever been a part of, I've absorbed by sheer cultural osmosis against my will. With that said, yeah, it's pretty much impossible to completely divorce Taylor Swift's music from Taylor Swift's the person. Since as much as she appears to hate on the tabloid attention she gets over her relationships and feuds, she also plays into it a lot and has zero problem monetizing that stuff, which I sort of respect. I swear I don't love the drama. It loves me. But what I think was the stroke of genius of 1989 is that even the songs most aggressively intricated to Taylor's public life narrative were still vague enough that one could relate to. Even stuff like Style and Bad Blood still spoke about human feelings and situations that, as connected to her image as they were, you didn't have to be Taylor Swift to identify with them. That's a really smart business move, by the way. Make songs deeply connected to your own public persona, which people are obsessed with, but construct them in a way that speaks to the shared human experience so they can appeal to everyone else. And then her follow-up single dropped. Oh, look what you made me do. Look what you made me do. Well, it's bad. It's a bad song. Come on, guys. The lyrics are Baby Emo's first live journal levels of cringe, and the EDM heavy production that keeps hitting you over the head makes it practically unlistenable. But that's not the real issue here. No, 
All of the bad comes from it being made with the specific intent of targeting only the people who've avidly consumed all of the TMZ articles published about Sailor for the past 10 years. If you're a time traveler from 2005 with absolutely no knowledge of Taylor's long public life history, and you listen to this, The old Taylor can't come to the phone right now, because she's dead. It would make no sense to you whatsoever. I tried listening to the rest of the album when it dropped, but my suspicions were quickly confirmed that the first single was not a fluke. It was the actual recurring theme in all of the tracks. So I think I made it to mid-track 4 before I just gave up. And for about a year, I didn't think much about Taylor Swift at all. But then I had to go and watch the Reputation tour on Netflix. Okay, confession time. I'm a sucker for a great light performance. And the Reputation tour with its big, expensive, shiny production values and good choreography and better arrangements of the Reputation album's tracks, well, it hooked me in. So much so that I went back and finally listened to the Godforsaken album all the way through. And while I'm still firmly of the opinion that most of it is terrible, I'll admit it, I kinda like it. And I come back to it more than once. For fun. Yes, even... <laughs> but what I was really curious about was to see where Taylor would go moving forward. The Reputation album was by no means a flop, but it didn't have the seemingly universal acclaim of 1989. And when the single started on the performing, I imagined she would steer her next album and image in a different direction, once she picked up on the fact that it doesn't make for very compelling music when she's singing about nothing but herself. I promise that you'll never find another like me. Or maybe she would personally tell me to shut the hell up, I don't know what I'm talking about, by releasing a remarkably unremarkable single in which she keeps doing the same thing she was doing, but in a different color palette. Fine. At least this time around I don't hate the song, honestly I find it so bland to incite any strong feelings in me one way or the other. So I guess I'm out again, back to not think about Taylor Swift's for the foreseeable future. What? Wait. I... <sighs> I'm Boo Boo. Boo Boo the Fool. Okay, um, coming from literally any other female pop star in the world, this would not come as a surprise to anybody. It would garner some attention, sure, but it wouldn't leave anyone feeling like they're in a weird acid trip directed by David Lynch while in slip paralysis like I feel. <laughs> I don't understand what's happening. You see, Taylor Swift has carefully spent her career actively not taking a stance on anything that could be even remotely construed as political. Even her 1989 brand of feminism didn't amount to anything outside of girl power. But then last year, she shocked everybody by speaking out about the fact the world is, you know, on fire, and urged her fans to register to vote. And not just vote, but specifically vote Democrat. But even then, I think most of us thought that was a one-time thing and not our first look at the brand new upcoming activist Taylor. So yeah, I I was completely unprepared for this. In fact, I don't think anyone was prepared for this. Shade never made anybody less gay. To be fair, this isn't the first time she's acknowledged her queer fans and queer people's overall existence in her work, but this is absolutely the first time she's gone full on I love my queer children mode. Which is awesome, right? I mean, you can't deny the power it has when the biggest pop star in the world openly defends and advocates for her queer following in a mainstream pop song and video. This is great. It's great. So why do I feel so meh about this? I spent weeks trying to answer this question until I finally reached a very simple conclusion, but we'll get back to that later. You see, this whole thing got me thinking. It's definitely not the first time whoever is currently the biggest name in the pop world has expressed their support for their queer following and for queer rights. If we're being honest, nowadays this is pretty much expected from any female pop star. Queer people, especially gay men, have a long, rich history tied to pop divas. But this outspoken show of support by the divas part wasn't always the standard. So I think this warrants a broader discussion. When does this start being the norm? How do we get here? And perhaps most importantly, why are divas even such a huge part of queer culture in the first place? Let's try to answer that, but just a heads up. For the purpose of this one video, I'll be focusing mainly on gay male culture. 
the L's, the B's, the T's, and the Q's also participate in the worship culture, and a lot of the reasons why overlap with the G's. But each group has their own particularities that I'm not going to analyze too deeply here because A, I want to look at why gay men are more popularly associated with this culture, and B, this video is already going to run way too freaking long. Also, hashtag not all gay men and how dare you imply the sexual orientation could influence something as superfluous as one's musical preferences. Sure, I don't mean you. You are different. The chosen gay who lives beyond cultural and sociological influences and goes through life completely unaffected by them. You're the one the prophecy spoke of. You're the special. Please don't leave me comments of this nature. Or actually do, because it gives me engagement. Let's begin. Diva fandom has been such a present part of our shared community that I have a gay gut feeling with absolutely no theoretical evidence to back it up that it's been around since almost the beginning of time. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if the first gay caveman in the first group of humans whose brain had evolved enough to allow for othering, early socioeconomic systems and music making were all standing for the first cavewoman who made the most harmonically pleasant guttural sounds while banging rocks together in a way that gave them feels. But for the purpose of actual academia, this phenomenon as we know it today appears to have begun in the 17th century with the rise and popularity of the opera. Opera? What a bunch of dorks! la dee da frou -frou ladies in wigs, singing a lot of $2 words about nothing. You're probably familiar with the opera queen stereotype, even if not by name. In the 20th century, the idea of gay men being huge opera fans was so widespread it was considered to be part of the universal gay male experience. Which is funny, because the label has only really ever applied to a very particular elite group of white, upper-class, urban gay men. Nonetheless, the term was embraced and used by many members of the community who proudly proclaimed themselves to be opera queens. And as with any type of fandom, each of them had their fave, here found in the figure of the prima donna, aka the lead singing lady of an opera company. Prima donna, first lady of the stage. The prima donna is the first prototype we see of the diva, having been a staple of the genre since it evolved to our modern definition of the opera. One of the most commonly standard singers to this day is Greek soprano Maria Callas. <laughs> Alice superfans would buy her records, learn everything they could about her life, and flock to her live performances and droves, mimicking our behavior regarding our favorite pop stars today. But why the opera genre and the prima donna were so attractive to gay men? In opera sex and other vital matters, author Paul Robinson argues that a lot of it had to do with the aesthetics. Most specifically, the genre's campy, cliched, and exaggerated portrayals of heterosexual love as to be almost self parroting I love her! Does that mean nothing? I love her! In Diva Worship and the Sonic Search for Queer Rights, scholar Craig Jennix argues that camp can be read as a communal response to normativity and a form of bonding between minority subjects. In other words, the exaggerated abundance found in most operas can be interpreted by queer audiences as something of a transgression, a screw you to society's ideas of normalcy. The over-the-top theatricality of the genre exposed the physicality behind the heteronormative patriarchal system, revealing just how easily constructed and deconstructed it truly is, therefore appealing to the sensibilities of those rejected and shunned to the margins of society for not conforming and playing by the rules, creating a safe space for nonconformity in a mainstream culture that usually punishes such an offense. The world show no compassion to me! To quote LGBT activist and academic Michael Bronsky, in a world that represses emotions and forbids homosexuality, opera is a victory for hurting feeling over social and moral conventions. As for the prima donna, one could argue that, given she's the most dominant actor in a performance and therefore has most of the lines in the songs, naturally she gets the most attention from the audience. And as the characters they play are often going through some sort of romance-related tragedy, gay men in a homophobic society who are not able to freely express their love may see themselves reflected in the prima donna's performance. But as writer Mitchell Morris explains it, the prima donna's musicianship and acting ability are crucial to her winning a clack. But in the minds of her devotees, these become merely aspects of her personality, ingredients of her mystique. Opera, by its nature, tends to aim at grand gestures and passions as elements of a dramatic essentialism, and this colors the public view of the prima donna both on and off the stage. 
The publicity industry also works by creating essences, and so the primary means of gaining information about the beloved Tiva inevitably guides the devotee into painting her in a few broad strokes. At a very advanced point, the real presence of someone like Maria Callas on the stage or disc becomes more significant than her dramatic and musical power, since this latter are the results of her personal power. What this means is that talents and performance such as the gateway drugs, true devil worship, happens progressively, as one evolves from admiring not only a prima donna's talent, but the prima donna herself, to the point where artistic value even becomes secondary in their love for her. The 20th century is also when we see the rise of the old Hollywood divas, such as Mae West, Betty Davis, John Crawford, Elizabeth Taylor, Marilyn Monroe, etc. These women were known for their commanding, assertive, strong, but often vulnerable and conflicted personas both on and off screen. So we can look at the strength versus vulnerability they represented, their struggles for success both professionally and personally, as well as the outsider aspects they have for being women navigating a male-dominated industry as a parallel to gay men navigating a mostly heterosexual world and having to live double lives, thus explaining their queer lore. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. The first man ever said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. And no one was a better and clearer illustration of that than one of the biggest gay icons of all times. Some place where there isn't any trouble. Do you suppose there is such a place, Toto? If you're my generation or younger, you may only be familiar with this in passing as an anecdote of gay life past. But the truth is that Judy Garland's impact and importance for the gay male community cannot be overstated enough. Many a historian has gone so far as to make a direct correlation to gay men's shared grief over Garland's passing as the breaking point that led to the Stonewall riots hours after her funeral. But this is not an undisputed fact. What is undisputed is her popularity amongst gay men of the time, so much so that for many years the term friend of Dorothy was a common, coded way for them to identify each other in public. Her live concerts were known for the presence of gay men, even by straight people who used that knowledge as ammunition to openly shame and ridicule them because of fucking course they did. In a 2000 article for The Atlantic, Michael Joseph Gross explained Garland's appeal to gay men as such. Garland embodied many of the paradoxical emotional states that gay men commonly experience while coming out. Vulnerability and strength, sincerity and duplicity, self-consciousness and abandon, adolescence and maturity. Excavating the gay Garland connection should begin, however, with considering how Garland stands out from other movie divas who have been glorified in gay culture. Their strength was thoroughly self-assertive. Hers was self-effacing. Beginning as the supportive, long-suffering and sexual foil for Mickey Rooney's adolescent adventures, she grew into a concert performer whose every appearance cried out, as the film director Stanley Kramer observed, Here is my heart. Break it. Gross goes on to divide Garland's signature songs into two categories as to make a direct parallel to gay men's lives. Songs that expose loneliness and vulnerability, and songs that trance a delirious confidence in love. Garland was a very unhappy, insecure woman through a good chunk of her life. She didn't have confidence in her talent, went through four divorces, one suicide attempt, got herself buried in millions of dollars of debt, and had an alcohol and drug addiction that ultimately led to her death at 47 years old. All the while, her movie and TV persona was painted as the innocent girl next door. Publicly, she was the very image of happiness and stability. Privately, she was constantly battling her inner demons. So, her life very much mirrored the shared queer life experience, especially back then, leading to such a widespread cross-gender identification amongst gay men that it's no wonder she quickly got elevated to icon status. But although Judy was the biggest gay icon of her time, and would occasionally throw a subtle wink the way of her gay audience, she still had an ambivalent relationship with them. Sometimes, she reportedly appeared to embrace and love her queer following, while other times, not so much. Time magazine in a recent story said that Judy Garland, for some reason, which was not clear to me, uh, attracts a lot of uh, homosexuals in her Oh, audience. I think that, I think that's the most ridiculous thing, because I have, in my audiences, I have little children who, you know, from uh, seeing the, the Wizard of Oz, and I have, uh, strangely enough now, I have many teenagers 
and uh, then people my age. And uh, the woman who who uh, interviewed that uh, was really quite unhappy that I was a hit. <laughs> and uh, she, she, also, you. <laughs> she also had a few problems of her own. She was talk about homosexuals. Well, she she uh, well, she was a fella. I think our insecurity stands then and now. Would you find her remarks in this interview as harmless or even progressive? I mean, this was uploaded to YouTube with the title A Gay Icon Defends Her Gay Audience. And I can totally see why they think that. This was a 60s free Stonewall. Honestly, this was as benign a comment as the gay community could get from a famous superstar back then. But this would change. Change to the point where if a diva were to make these comments now, there would be public outcry and even straight allies would write their think pieces in our defense. So what happened? What, or better yet, who, was largely responsible for shifting mainstream perceptions of queer people and openly acknowledging, embracing, and defending them. Who was that girl? Okay, let me add a disclaimer here, otherwise people will find this video and get angry with me. I'm not saying Madonna was the first diva to champion for queer rights and visibility. Cher, for instance, is often credited for introducing drag to the mainstream after hiring two drag queens to perform with her back in 79. All I'm saying is that the impact Madonna had on popular culture at the height of her career was unprecedented for a female pop star, and she's used a lot of her time in the spotlight up to this day to advocate for the queer community. It's not hyperbolic or fanboyish to say that the world will probably be a lot different for queer people today if not for Madonna. And in my opinion, she's more than earned the title of the greatest gay icon of all times as bestowed by the advocates in 2013. She changed the game. I can't go into every single thing she's done for queer people in the last 37 years or will be here forever, so I'm just gonna show you the highlights reel to prove my point. Strap in. In October 1982, Madonna released her first single, Everybody, yep, I am fucking around, kids. We're gonna start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. The video, made with a paltry $1,500, was filmed on location at the extinct gay disco Paradise Garage, thus working her first connection with the queer community in her work, but not at all the beginning of her personal relationship with gay men in her life. Back when she was a teenager, the first person to recognize and encourage her talents was her ballet teacher, Christopher Flynn, a gay man who went on to introduce her to the local gay scene at her hometown in Rochester, Michigan, leading to her catching on that one of her own brothers, Christopher Saccone, was gay too. Flynn would later encourage her to move to Manhattan and pursue professional dancing, which would lead to her singing career and her becoming the cultural icon she is today. I don't think most people are aware how literal she was when, in 2010, she bluntly put it herself on The Ellen Show. I wouldn't have a career if it weren't for the gay community. At the same time Madonna exploded into superstardom in the mid-80s, the AIDS epidemic broke, affecting firstly and primarily gay men, leading to people calling it the gay cancer. But even before medical science had a name for this disease, with fear and panic spreading through myths or no information, and people believing the HIV virus could be transmitted by touch or just by breathing the same air as someone who was infected, Madonna frequently visited gay friends in their hospital beds, hugged them, kissed them, and lay by their side, going so far as to make runs over to Mexico in search for experimental drugs not legal in the US, rumored to slow down or even cure the disease. She was also one of the first public figures to take a stand against HIV and AIDS stigmatization. When even the President of the United States, limp dick, donkey shit murderer Ronald Reagan didn't have the balls to address the crisis. She was also one of the first people to advocate for safe sex, putting the message as straightforward as possible in her 1987 Who's That Girl World Tour, including an insert with safe sex practice guidelines and myth busting on HIV and AIDS in the first pressing of the Like a Prayer album two years later, an album which included the song Spanish Eyes. But just in case the song was too subtle for the thickest of heterosexual heads, in 1992 she recorded In This Life for the album Erotica, introducing it like this on the Girl The Show tour the following year. This next song I wrote about two very dear friends of mine who died of AIDS, the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. For all of you out there who understand what I'm talking about, don't give up. 
But wait, go back! In 1986, she debuted her best song ever, The To Tell, No I Would Not Accept Different Opinions, at a charity concert for AIDS research and dedicated it to the memory of Martin Burgoyne, one of the friends she lost to AIDS. Then in 1990, after seeing performances in ballrooms and being blown away by the movements, she decided to bring some of the underground gay scene to the mainstream and change the direction of pop music again with just three simple words. Now the world knew about voguing. There was some genuinely valid criticism about appropriation here, and perhaps we'll talk about it some other day, but in the meantime, she wasn't done yet. Later that year, she went on the Blood Ambition Tour. Madonna sold out stadiums everywhere, from Japan to Dallas, and took this opportunity to have her male dancers, all of whom were gay with the exception of one, dance together, to choreography dressed as mermen, and remind people once again to, for God's sake, put on a condom. Save. Sex. 1991, she releases the groundbreaking documentary Truth or Dare, registering the run of the Blood Ambition Tour, where she documents a gay pride march, speaks candidly about AIDS again, follows the lives of her gay dancers, and includes an explicit scene of two of them sharing a passionate kiss during a game of Truth or Dare. When confronted about her decision to include this scene in the final cut, she had this to say. Your fans will love the film, I think, but some people are going to find sections of it offensive. Well, that's their problem, though. You, you don't if care? They're no, of course not, because, see, these things exist in life. I'm only presenting life. You know, if you keep putting something in somebody's face, eventually, you know, maybe they can come to terms with it. This is Madonna on a one-woman crusade to change the world? To change people's attitudes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Quite flatly, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to, but maybe I'll start. Maybe I'll open the door. Okay. Somebody's got to do it, and you got to start somewhere. In the music videos for Just Find My Love and Erotica, she once again breaks the taboo and depicts same-sex intimacy and desire, cross-dressing and trans people. In the Deeper and Deeper video, she does a tribute to her late friend Andrew Warhol and gives the gays everything they want by casting Warhol superstar, Hollywood blonde, gay porn star Joey Stefano, and gay porn director Chichi LaRue in her big love letter to the 70s disco scene. Then in 1999, the MTV Video Music Awards honors her breaking the record of most nominated artists in the ceremony's history by throwing her a drag queen tribute, which I include here just because it was awesome. All I have to say is that it takes a real man to fill my shoes. 2005, she releases Confessions on the Dance Floor, her gayest album yet, which is saying something because it's Madonna we're talking about mixing disco with contemporary electronic music and causing millions of gay boys to lose their minds when they heard that ABBA sample at the club at the beginning of Hung Up. Yes, this counts because shut up! <laughs> For the performance of Forbidden Love in the 2006 Confessions Tour, she decides to tackle homophobia and the Israel-Palestine conflict in the same number because bitch, she's Madonna. By the way, the 2010 interview I mentioned earlier was Madonna answering to the recent wave of publicized suicides affecting gay teens and speaking out against bullying. Two years later, she comes on the show again and Ellen reveals this little nugget of information. Madonna called me out of the blue. We had never met. I just all of a sudden get a call saying it's Madonna and I just want to say that I'm behind you, I'm with you, I support you. That same year, she went to Russia and, during a concert in St. Petersburg, denounced the country's recently passed homosexual propaganda laws, which forbade people to publicly speak about queer issues, claiming they were inappropriate for and could influence kids into becoming gay, and equating homosexuality with pedophilia, and my god, Russia just keeps getting worse somehow. Oh, also worth noting that that tour's opener was this performance. Girl gone wild, okay, girl gone wild. Even though the Russian government threatens to close down the show and arrest her on stage, she delivers a speech as planned, and later Putin's boys sue her for $10 million, which is just adorable. Last month, she performs at the World Pride New York in the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, reiterating her love for and commitment to her queer fans and performing God Control a song advocating gun control which had an accompanying video inspired by any memory of the post shootings. <laughs> I'm gonna stop there. But this was me scratching the surface. By now, I think I have painted a big enough picture to illustrate why so many queer people did and still do treat Madonna as if she were a deity, and why I'm comfortable with doubling down my previous statement. The world will probably be a lot different for queer people today if not for Madonna. At a time when mainstream acceptance of us LGBTQ folks was at an all-time low due to all those fears and anxieties brought on by the AIDS crisis, and back when very few public figures were talking positively about us, this woman, who was the biggest pop star in the world, said fuck that noise and gave us visibility, love, and hope. 
is speaking for and fighting with us when almost no one else did. But why did they have a problem with two adults, you know, two consenting adults displaying affection for each other regardless of their sex? Remember, her public advocacy began around four years after she released her first song, when she had just recently climbed to the top of the world. She had nothing to gain and everything to lose by sticking by us, but she didn't care. She found herself in the queer community before she became a superstar, and she didn't turn her back to us after. Again, I'm not crediting Madonna alone for popularizing diverse activism and vocal expressions of love toward their queer fans. Even around the time Madonna was first doing it, some of her contemporaries such as Cindy Lauper, Janet Jackson, and Kylie Minogue were also embracing their queer audience. But perhaps because Madonna had a bigger following, she had the hardest impact and influence on the mainstream public. And once she had opened that door, no one who came after her dared close it. So here's when we need to talk about parasocial relationships. If you're unfamiliar with the term, it was coined by sociologists Donald Horton and Richard Wool as a way to describe the psychological relationship formed by an audience and a performer through mass media consumption. In other words, it's the psychological effects that cause us to stop seeing celebrities as strangers and start thinking of them as our friends or other types of personal connections, like a sister or a mother. This is the manifesto of Mother Monster. What makes parasocial relationships form so easily is that they're not only welcomed, but actively cultivated by established celebrities and industry newcomers alike. They're the basis on which a loyal fan base is built. And it took zero seconds for aspiring pop divas and their managers to catch on to how big of a contributing factor Madonna's queer friendly stance was to her success. Turns out queer people are more easily drawn to divas who say and show they have our backs. And after Madonna proved that to be safe, we started seeing everyone falling on her footsteps, and I do mean everyone. No medication of violence being transgender thy Make some noise if you think the four Supreme Court justices who voted against gay marriage should get their heads out of their fucking asses and join the goddamn celebration. There's also men in dresses. There, there is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dresses, I yeah. think that's cool. It's a real mix. And when we look out into the audience, people can be themselves. And I'll be going purple to take a stand against bullying in support of LGBT youth. Keep going. I trust you. It looks absolutely beautiful. And it just doesn't make sense to me, you know, um, why you would put so much money behind something between stopping people from loving each other and bonding together. Baby, by the way, I'm not saying this is A, a bad thing, or B, just a shameless capitalist move by the part of these artists. I don't doubt for a second that these women are sincere in their love for their queer fans. Many of them, like Beyoncé or Ariana Grande, have personal stakes in their activism. Family members who are gay. Lady Gaga is bisexual herself, and virtually every pop diva has spoken about having gay friends, and stylists, and makeup artists, which, of course they do, this is the entertainment industry. I'm just saying that catering to a lucrative market and establishing a strong parasocial bond with the people who form it is also a really smart business practice. It's a win-win situation. We get welcomed with open arms by influential famous people with the power to change society's perceptions and laws about us, and they gain a loyal fan base who obsessively follow their career, fill the sports stadiums and arenas, and buy their fancy beauty or MDNA skin products. So, Devil worship has never been only about the music or the movie or the performance, which, well, when I was doing research for this video, I found this article in which the writer Jimmy Draper argues that divas of the past were idolized for their own tragic narratives that mirror the struggles of queer life, but divas of the present are revered for their contributions to queer activism, which I think is limiting. I agree that there's been a shift to an emphasis on queer advocacy in current diva fandom, but I don't see a clear-cut either-or situation here when I look at the entire history. Whether in relation to the grandiosity of the prima donna, the personal tragedies of old Hollywood actresses or the queer-friendly stance of our modern pop stars, it's pretty clear to me that at least some degree of self-identification has always and will continue to play a crucial role in why we stand. I don't believe we'd be as passionate about our divas if we didn't feel like they were caring even if just one small piece of ourselves in them. And they know that. Otherwise, why would they bother having a social media presence, doing interviews, or talking to the audience in the shows at all? 
and showing their support for our community is a way of getting us to identify with them anyway, so... Yeah, I don't see the self-identification going obsolete anytime soon. But of course, there is a flip side to parasocial relationships. Forming an emotional bond to a relatable stranger can be great in that their work and or their life experiences can speak to us in such a way that helps us remember that our own emotions and experiences do matter, making us feel less alone and more validated. There's also the sense of community when you're part of a fandom. Meeting and connecting with a bunch of people who share a love for something or someone is always awesome. And that's why we'll probably proclaim ourselves Madonna Queens or Little Monsters or Arianators, the Beehive, Swifties, etc. But the thing about these divas and idols is that they're not real people. They're characters we created in our heads based on our own perceived ideas of them. So when they deviate from the narrative we wrote for them in our minds, which they inevitably will because they're human, the emotional investment resulting from the parasocial bonds means we'll take this deviation personally. Here's how this works. I'm a huge Madonna fan, if that wasn't painfully obvious by now, and I used to really hate her social media presence, especially her selfies on Instagram. I found them embarrassing, unworthy and alike of the queen. Which, when I say this out loud, it makes me wanna laugh at just how absurd this whole thing is. Me, a rando she's never met, knows better than Madonna what is or isn't unlike Madonna. But that's how I felt just because the Madonna in the real world living her life wasn't aligning with the Madonna I had in my head. Even more recently, I was seriously upset about her decision to work with Quavo, who I knew of only due to his homophobic remarks. Now, if I heard that, I don't know, Rosalia, someone I have no emotional investment in whatsoever, was working with Quavo, I wouldn't give a fuck. Who cares? I don't know her. But when I learned Madonna was doing it, I felt angry, disappointed, even betrayed. It didn't matter that rationally I was aware that I don't really know her. I only have an overall idea of who she is based on the information out in the world about her. Meaning, as Mitchell Morris put it, all I can ever truly do is paint her in a few broad strokes. That didn't stop me from taking the Quavo thing personally because it's not Madonna the real-life stranger that I'm attached to. It's Madonna the figure. It's what she means to me. Remember Live to Tell, the song I said was her best ever? What I really meant by that is that it's the most important and significant song of not just her, but any artist to me. There's a long history there I won't bore you with, but suffice to say that song has followed me my whole life in some way, shape or form ever since I was a child, and its meaning evolved as I went through different stages of my life, ultimately being responsible for me becoming a Madonna fan. When I was going through a particularly tough time, I rediscovered that song and it spoke to me so deeply that I immediately hopped on YouTube to search for recent performances. That's when I found her singing on a crucifix, with a crown of thorns in her head, as the backdrop screens behind her urged people to help relieve the AIDS crisis in Africa. The whole thing blew my mind so hard, I went searching for more and more of that particular show until I'd seen it all but still one and more. Like I said, I'm a sucker for a great performance. After that, I started learning more about her life, her ties to the queer community and her activism, and being a very angry gay boy, it didn't take long for me to identify her rebellious and subversive nature. Her music made me feel hopeful, happy, sexy, sad, defiant, vulnerable, and like I could take whatever life threw at me as long as I had her songs to turn to and herself as a role model to derive strength from to help me navigate it and oops, there's a parasocial relationship we've been talking about. See what I meant with talented performance such as the gateway drugs? I got over the Quavo thing, by the way. I still wish it collabed with somebody else, but the thing is, nothing can change the emotional significance Madonna, or my idea of Madonna, has to me. Also, I did that Stan thing of going, well, maybe she didn't know the guy is a dick. And unfortunately, I do like the song they made together. Your future is bright, just don't turn out the lights. Stands are gonna stand. Okay, now let's go back to that initial question. As I said at the beginning, you can't deny the power it has when the biggest pop star in the world openly defends and advocates for her queer following in a mainstream pop song and video. So why am I so not impressed by Taylor Swift doing just that? Well, I've already told you the answer to that was simple, but YouTuber Todd in the Shadows made a video where he laid down my thoughts in a much more articulate and intelligent way that I could ever hope to, so, I'm gonna cheat and let him speak for me on this one. To me, this is not a gay rights song. It's an anti-hater song like Taylor's other hater songs that just happens to have a verse about gay bashers. So, uh, yeah, it's a real interesting move for Taylor to be all like, I, and also, the gays, have too many haters. I mean, yes, it's good to make supportive statements. It's good that she's doing it. 
It's good that McDonald's does it. It's better than not doing it. But that doesn't mean I gotta be moved or impressed that my McRib came with a rainbow on the wrapper. And that's basically it. Taylor has been the hugest name in the pop world for a few years now, measuring by sales and mainstream attention. I think I might have felt warmer about this song if she had released it earlier in her career, but for many many years she would only throw the occasional wink at her queer fans, while everybody else was being a lot more outspoken. But only now when she's got nothing left to lose but something to gain after her previous album didn't deliver as many hits as the one before, her blatantly pandering to her queer audience in a tone deaf song equating her haters with actual LGBTQ persecution that often results in mental health issues, suicide and murder, and presenting it with a cute rainbow color video featuring a bunch of queer celebrities I've heard of, simply does not do it for me. I've seen it all before and it meant something to me then. This means nothing. And I'm still extremely thankful to Taylor for doing this. Yeah. Look, a part of me wants to succumb to my grumpy cynical mode, and I will continue to be critical of and unimpressed by the song and video, but this was not made for me. I already have my pride anthems and my gay icons. This was made for the ones who don't. The young queer Taylor fans and even non-fans who are going through a difficult time, feeling trapped and isolated, and who need and deserve to be uplifted empowered and reminded that life does get better, and that there's a bunch of people out in the world who love them for the beautiful people they are. They're the ones this was made for, and they're the only ones whose opinions truly matter on this. I'm of the opinion that, regardless of how I feel about a certain artist or song, if it gets so much as one queer kid to smile and helps them get through to tomorrow, that's 100% a net positive in the world to me. So thanks, Taylor. I wish you success with your new album, but since I'm not connecting with any of the singles, I think I'm gonna sit this era out entirely. Who could ever leave me, darling? But who could stay? Hey guys, Vinny here. I just wanted to say a quick thank you to everybody who has subscribed to the channel and who has given it a like or even just given it a watch. Just thank you very much. I, I enjoy doing these videos a lot, so it means really a lot to me that anybody's actually watching them. Uh, so yeah, if you like this video, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell. Oh, I'm also going to link to my other social media, uh, Twitter, Letterboxd, and that's about it. <laughs> but if you want to follow me there too, that's awesome. Um, yeah, can you tell that I suck at calls to action? Be gay, do crimes, and see you next time. <laughs> Bye, guys.